In this lesson, we're learning over a hundred new nouns. To do this, we'll simply go through Joel's house one room at a time, filling them up with all the most common nouns that we haven't learned previously. Let's dive straight in, starting with his hall, which stores physical nouns. Hanging from Joel's ceiling, we find the most common substances that he talks about: water, light, and fire. On the left side, the chandelier gives light via some very loose light bulbs, and Joel's word for light is luz. Meanwhile, just in case the light bulbs get too hot, this chandelier is created with several built-in water taps, sort of like fire protection sprinklers, occasionally spraying out a blue-green watery substance that Joel calls agua. On the right side, Joel has a wig. Dangling down from the ceiling and producing flames and smoke, Joel's word for fire is fuego, with a stress on wig. Fuego. Behind Joel's stairs in the hall, he keeps pictures of animals. In particular, on the right, he has a pear-shaped picture of a dog, which he calls a perro. Just remember to picture it as if it's shaped like a pear. Perro. In front of the stairs, Joel has a table where he keeps all the foods that can't be found in the kitchen, mostly for daytime snacks. On the left, above the table, he has posted a sign that says "Come eat." His word for food sounds like this: it's comida. On the right edge of this table, Joel has wrapped some small cans of food in yen bills. His word for goods, as in things that you own or sell, such as canned goods. Is bienes, so a good is un bien. Now, admittedly, this may seem a bit weird since his adverb for well is bien, but his adjective for good is bueno, and yet the noun is bien. Further back to the left is the door to the kitchen, but this so-called door is made of cloth. It's basically a curtain. When Joel is bored, sometimes he likes to wrap himself in this so-called door, and he says, "Look, I'm wearing the door." For this reason, his word for door has the stress syllable "wear," puerta. Among the pink coasters on the left side of the floor, in front of this door, one item stands out. It's a tiny piece of furniture that's shaped like a comma, but it's pink like the coasters around it. Sometimes Joel is too tired to fly upstairs or even to crawl upstairs, so he rests on this tiny comma-shaped bed for the night. If you can picture Joel curled up in bed, you can see that he would look kind of like the shape of a comma. His word for bed is cama. Upstairs on the balcony above this, Joel has a suit of armor that holds a weapon. The weapon is difficult to identify, although it's shaped kind of like a human arm. Joel's word for weapon is arma. The window on the right side of the room shows the weather outside, but it's a special window that somehow exaggerates the weather depending on the time of day. For example, as the sun comes up on a clear day, the window displays a calm, smooth scene. But if there's any rain at all, The window turns into a violent display of shapes and colors as the day goes on. This window looks scariest at sunset during a storm. Joel's word for weather is tiempo. This may seem a bit odd because we think of tiempo as time, but out here in the hall it has a different meaning. For example, good weather is buen tiempo. In front of this window, falling from the dinero bag that we learned about earlier, is a shower of U.S. dollars. Joel's disappointed. He says, "I wanted yen, not dollars. Why did Robin Hood mess this up?" His word for dollars is dólares, so it's basically a cognate. A dollar is un dólar. Below these dollars on the table is Joel's telephone. This phone's receptor is made from a leaf. Joel feels a little uncomfortable whenever he speaks on this phone because his mustache brushes against the leaf, 
and it tickles him. His word for telephone sounds a lot like our word for telephone, but it stresses lef, like leaf. So the word is telefono. On this same table is a drill. It's stuck into the table. When Joel first bought this drill, the first thing he did was go home and stick it through the table. Although it got stuck and he was never able to get the drill out again, Joel was impressed that it has the ability to put holes in things so easily. Joel declared, that's a keeper. I guess he can't help but keep it now that it's stuck in the table. His word for equipment is equipo. On the floor in the walkway of the hall is a toy car. This car is much smaller than the real cars that Joel keeps outside, but he likes to drive this tiny car around the house once in a while. Since it's a remote control car, he also likes to surprise his guests with it. He can sometimes program it to drive at them automatically when they first open the door just to startle them. His word for car is auto. For the most part, these physical nouns are basically simple labels. You can use them easily exactly as their equivalents would be used in English. But note that in some cases, such as the one we're about to mention, it's common to put definite articles, usually el or la, before the noun, even when we wouldn't in English. If you want to say, he liked to play with fire, you would typically say, he liked to play with the fire. Le, it was pleasing to play con el fuego. Let's practice using a few other nouns. The weather is nice right now. El tiempo es bueno ahora. So there was neither food nor money there. Entonces no había ni comida ni dinero ahí. Now in the next example, you're going to see something strange. The phrase el agua. If you were paying attention to where these words are located, agua is on the left side of Joel's main hall. So why would we say el agua? This is a strange exception to the rule because agua starts with the letter A or A. Spanish speakers avoid saying la agua and instead use the so-called incorrect el. However, agua is indeed a feminine noun. For example, the correct water would be el agua correcta, using a feminine adjective. This would apply to the word arma as well for weapon. The weapon would be el arma, even though a weapon would be Una arma. It is feminine. Just remember that with nouns that start with the letter A, if you would use la, you're actually going to use the incorrect or incongruent el before it most of the time. Now for an idiom using puerta or door. The phrase la puerta de atrás means the back door, though it's literally translated the door of back. The front door could be la puerta de De adelante. Let's also learn something interesting that you can do with most Spanish nouns. Let's take the word perro, which is dog, and then change the O at the end to ito, perrito. Suddenly, instead of dog, we have little dog or doggy. This is technically called the diminutive but it's often used to create a term of endearment for someone very close and familiar to you. So instead of just saying dog, you can say doggy or perrito. In fact, many names can easily be transformed into a nickname this way. Ana becomes Anita. Luna becomes Lunita, and so on. This isn't something you would do when you first meet someone, but it might be something you would do for someone very close to you. In one of the dialogues that we're studying, a little girl describes her dog as una perrita, or a little girl doggy. Now let's turn left from the main hall to the family room, which stores family members. Joel's uncle has made an appearance here. Joel has always liked his uncle because he always makes Joel happy by bringing him tea. Joel calls his uncle his tío. Actually, Joel occasionally calls other people tío in a casual way, using it kind of like the word tipo. This use of tío 
is common in Spain. Let's also look at the relationships between some of these people in this room. So we've already described that Joel's parents are here sitting next to each other, and each one of them seems to want to subject their children by putting their feet on top of them. So the parent-child relationship would be padre or hijo, so parent or child. Now, those are the vertical relationships, but what about the horizontal relationships, such as between parent and parent, or between brother and sister? First of all, imagine that Joel's parents are looking into each other's eyes lovingly. This spouse relationship gives us the word esposo or esposa, which would mean husband or wife. But the horizontal relationship between Joel and his sister, unfortunately, is not so positive. In Joel's world, or at least in his family, siblings fight constantly, and they basically need a referee to keep them from killing each other. A man stands between them, holding up very large hands to stop Joel from getting to his sister, and vice versa. Because this man represents the relationship between Joel and his sister, Joel's word for sister is hermana, with a stress on man. And his word for brother would be Hermano. Now we'll turn to the stage, which is what Joel's family is watching. This is where we store various categories of nouns for people that aren't family members. On the window above the stage, we find an interesting tracing of a human. When the sun hits this person, the person glows yellow. This represents Joel's general word for person, which is persona with a stress on son. Note that this tracing is only on the left side of the window. Strangely, the word for person is always feminine, no matter whether the person is male or female. So, a person is always una persona. This word is also commonly plural. Several persons or several people is typically stated as algunas personas. On the right side of this same window above the stage, Joel represents the only two alternatives that he knows to persons besides animals, and these would be spirits. One is a devil that he's traced. Joel drew it on the window as having horns and amazing abs because Joel imagines that a devil must be strong. His word for this is diablo. So you have the stress on ab there, diablo. In addition to that, we have a group of circles, like the letter O, drawn several times. Joel can't imagine what a god would look like, so he simply represents it with O's, and his word for god is Dios. Before we get to the stage itself, let's revisit the walls on either side of the stage, which have pictures of groups of people. We've already learned la gente to mean the people. Some other groups might be the family, the class, the police, or the team. On the left side, along with la gente, Joel has posted pictures of the categories of people that he might recruit as actors. One category is family. He has a picture of a happy family sitting down and eating a meal. For him, the concept of family is basically equivalent to a bunch of people eating a meal together, so this is how he always represents it. So his word for family is familia. Another category is class. We simply have a picture of students sitting in a classroom, and the word for class is classe. La classe would be the class. A final category is police. Joel displays a group of policemen all blindfolded so that they can't see what they're doing for some reason. The police, as a group, is la policia, with a stress on C, because they can't see. On the right side of the stage are some more posters, but here he's advertising two very dark plays that he wants to put on. One of these is called The Team. In this, a band of men with electric drills, run around terrorizing people. This represents the word equipo, which looks and sounds like the word that we learned in Joel's Hall, but when it's used to refer to a group of people, equipo means team. 
Below the equipo poster is a picture of a bunch of people about to be hit by a wave. Joel is imagining an upcoming play where this group of people, basically an enormous family, is suddenly eliminated by a tsunami. This represents the word pueblo, with a stress on wave. Remember that Joel's B's sound a lot like his V's, so the stress syllable sounds like wave, but the word is pueblo. Pueblo essentially means people, but in a different sense from gente. Whereas la gente generally refers to any group of people, el pueblo tends to refer to a people group, such as all the people of a nation. Note that any group word represented on these posters that I just described typically gets a singular article. You would say la familia, la clase, la policía, la gente, el equipo, or el pueblo. Now let's go to the stage itself, where we'll find that there are many new actors in Joel's current play. Remember on the right side we have a mansion where a señor is standing and laughing at some of the people below him. Opposite this señor and his mansion is a similar mansion on the left side. This one is where the formal wealthy women live. There are two of them, an older señora and a younger señorita. In general, señora means mrs., and señorita means miss. But just like señor, these words tend to indicate dignity or status. For example, sometimes parents may tell their daughter to behave like a señorita, or act like a young lady. Between these two ends of the stage, Joel has positioned a long line of kids— Almost all of these younger people are dressed in chicken costumes. This represents the word chico, which means kid or child. This word has some variations. Chicos means boys, and chicas means girls. Now, this word can refer to boys and girls of all ages. Or sometimes chicos simply means guys, as a very informal word for any group of people. However, the children are behaving differently based on their ages. The youngest kids have fallen on their knees and torn their costumes, hurting themselves. Since these young kids all have a way of hurting their knees, Joel calls them niños or niñas. Meanwhile, the older teenage chicos are dancing and singing cha-cha, chacho. Joel finds this very annoying, and he tends to dislike teenagers in general, so they don't usually make it into his plays. He calls a teenager a muchacho or a muchacha. The only person who's not in a chicken costume here is the baby. Joel has basically no experience with babies, except that he has seen some moms and dads holding them. Remember that his word for mom is mama and his word for dad is papa. Accordingly, his word for baby is bebe. Meanwhile, the village idiot in the play is standing behind this line of kids. His main role is to say yo, 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 over and over, as he tries to hit a fly on his own forehead. Joel's word for idiot stresses yo, and the word is idiota. It ends with the letter A, whether the idiot is male or female. At the end of the señor porch on the right side, we find several professions that Joel finds interesting. Now, he's organized the people by his concept of importance. On the top are the four people who are in charge, and each of them has a subjected person below them of different professions. At the very top are what Joel considers royalty, a king, and a president. On the steps, but also as ruling authorities, are the lower master and boss. At the very top, a ray of light is shining down on the king. So Joel's word for king is rey. The president sits next to him sadly and the president feels silly because he's wearing a wig with a huge dent in it. The word for president is presidente. 
A little lower down, the master sits awkwardly trying to speak to the people below him, but all that comes out is, um, um, Joel's word for master is amo. Next to him, the boss is someone who calls himself a chief and wears feathers on his head. He gives orders kind of grumpily, and Joel calls this man Chief Head Feathers, or Jefe for short. So it sounds kind of like the beginnings of the words Head Feathers. The word Jefe means either boss or chief. Now again, each of these four rulers, the Rey, the Presidente, the Amo, and the Jefe, is serving someone beneath them. So the jefe is trying to give orders to a doctor, but the doctor is messing up. He's trying to heal a teddy bear, but instead he's accidentally torn the toy. So feathers from the teddy bear fly everywhere, because in Yol, teddy bears are stuffed with feathers. Joel's word for doctor is spelled just like the English word doctor, but it's pronounced doctor. So you stress tor because he tore the teddy bear. Meanwhile, the amo, saying um, is trying to give directions to a so-called captain. But the captain is not listening. This captain is enormous, and the amo feels helpless to give him any orders because he seems very powerful. Besides, he weighs so much that he's breaking the stage. This captain must weigh a ton. Joel's word for captain is capitan. Part of the reason that the president is sad is because someone has blindfolded the police officer that he's in charge of. The president doesn't know what to do about it. Joel's word for policeman is policia, with a stress on C because the policeman can't see. Finally, below the king, with the light shining on him, is a knight. This knight has been preparing for this position for a long time. He's been basking in the presence of the king for an entire year. And now that the year is over, he's officially a knight. Apparently that's how it works in this imaginary world. Joel's word for knight is caballero. So the stress sounds kind of like year, caballero. Note that the word caballero is common because it not only means knight, but also gentlemen in some cases. Before we move on, I recommend immersing yourself in this scene to the extent that you can to make sure that you can remember all of these words. Imagine that you're really on that stage feeling the shape of the president's dented wig and the texture of the policeman's blindfold. Pace between the steps of the senora and the senor. High-five all the chicos along the way and avoid bumping into the hombre's mule. You want to make sure you know where all of these people are and what they're called. Before we leave the stage, note that some occupations can be modified to be feminine. For example, el doctor can turn into la doctora if the doctor is a woman. And as of recently, it's become standard to call a president who is female la presidenta. The next room in Joel's house is the dining room. This is a room that we haven't looked at closely before. Although Joel eats casually throughout the day, he has some interesting superstitions when it comes to dinner in particular. He always prefers to have dinner in the dining room, and this room is almost a sacred place for Joel. Everything must be done with extreme care and perfect ritual. Joel tends to sit at the left end of the table, and his food is served to him on the right end. Before eating, Joel insists that everyone who's here must pass the peace pipe around the table. That way, there will supposedly be great peace during dinner. In fact, the more times they pass it around, the more peace there will be. The word for peace is pass. Joel strictly forbids swearing at the dinner table. Personally, he doesn't have a problem with swearing in general, but during dinner, he thinks that it's bad luck. Good luck, however, comes from wearing a green shirt that says, Don't swear! Bad luck! 
The word suerte means luck. When it's finally time to eat, despite the general peace that Joel has promoted, he has trouble controlling his feelings. He's emotionally very unstable when it comes to dinner. All of his feelings become exaggerated here. For example, if a servant comes in from the right side carrying a plate of food, Joel immediately becomes immensely affectionate. Even though the man who's carrying in the food is not special at all, Joel feels extreme affection for him in the moment, simply because he's carrying in food. Sometimes in these moments, Joel bursts out saying the word cariño, which means affection, but sounds kind of like carry in, cariño. Now, why is Joel so happy? Well, what the servant brought was a cooked goose. Joel finds geese annoying, but he feels a lot of morbid pleasure when he sees them dead. So when this goose appears at the table, cooked and ready to eat, Joel experiences great pleasure, and his word for pleasure is gusto. But nearby is something else that terrifies Joel. A bunch of disembodied human heads float in a jar on the right end of the table. These heads give Joel an enormous sense of fear when he looks at them, and his word for fear is miedo. So the stress sounds kind of like head with a silent H. Miedo. Finally, let's come to Joel's word for love. Joel doesn't think about love and affection the way that most people do. He feels the most affection, cariño, when someone carries in a dead goose for him to eat. But the more extreme word, love, can only be attained by providing Joel with more of these things that give him pleasure. To the right of the dining room table, more and more dinner supplies are in store and piled up in the shape of a heart. That's where Joel's most positive emotion is stored up. Give him more and more, and he'll experience the feeling that we identify as love. His word for love simply stresses the syllable more, amor. All of these words in the dining room, paz, suerte, miedo, amor, cariño, and gusto, can be used after the verb tener or dar. For example, to say, I have affection, you can say, tengo cariño. I am afraid is actually, I have fear, or tengo miedo. It gives me pleasure would be, me da gusto, and it gives me luck is, me da suerte. Normally, it's pretty easy to use these words if you simply use a conjugation of tener and then the word, or dar and then the word. But there are a few more uses for these words. Doing something with affection or con cariño simply means doing it nicely. Of course, you can do things with other emotions, but con cariño is one of the nicest ways to do something. Then there's another common idiom, the exclamation, ¡Qué suerte! or ¡What luck! This is often used not just in cases of luck or happenstance, but just something you're very happy about. For example, if someone does something nice for you, you might say, ¡Qué suerte! ¡Muchas gracias! Now, all in all, between the hall, the living room, the stage, and the dining room, we've learned a lot of nouns in this video. We still have about 80 more words to learn in this lesson, so before we move on, I recommend that you quiz yourself on these words to make sure you can remember them all, where they are, and how to use them.